So, Happy New Year, Faith Church. <laughs> we are in uh, Matthew this morning, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead, take them out, open them up, or turn them on. Now, there's an old church tradition that I absolutely love, and it's that the people would stand for the reading of Scripture. So if you're able, would you stand with me, and let's hear the word of the Lord together. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 14, this is Jesus speaking. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you remain standing, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this new year. And as we gather, we come here to meet you today. And so would you meet with us, and would you encounter us here today? And would you just take a moment and pray for yourself, whatever this last week or this last year has been like for you. Would you just pray that God would meet you right where you are today? And then would you take a moment and pray for me, that these would be God's words and not mine, and that they would be helpful to you. God, I ask that you remove me today and that you would speak to each and every one of us. Would you come and meet us here today? Would you encounter us in such a way that when we leave here, we would know you more, love you deeper than right now? And we ask this in Christ's precious name, amen. You may be seated. So we've been journeying through this series called Revealed, and we've been looking at Christ revealed through Scripture. And what's so fascinating to me about this passage today is that we started this journey in Exodus where Christ appears to Moses in the burning bush, and there he identifies himself as the I am. And then throughout the New Testament, throughout Jesus' ministry on earth, he makes a series of declarations as he embraces and steps into that identity. And we call these the I am statements. And he says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then among those sayings, he says, I am the light of the world. And what's so fascinating is here in Matthew, he says, you are the light of the world. He is the light of the world, and then he transfers that identity and purpose to you and me. And that's what I want to talk about today. See, according to Jesus, the way his love is revealed is through his church, through you and me. We are the light of the world, and we shine because Christ first shines in you and then through you. Notice in verse 16, Jesus does not tell us to shine the light or to turn on the light, because here's the thing. We can't turn on and off the light. Rather, it says, let your light shine. The passive voice here is intentional, right? There's nothing we can do to turn on and off this light. We are the light, right? Where once the love and the heart and the mind and the character of God was revealed through Jesus Christ and the Christophanies of the Old Testament, and then through the person of Jesus of Nazareth in the New Testament, today it's revealed through you and me. Jesus transfers that to us, not just in our identity, but also in our purpose. He, you notice again here in verse 16, it says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And what you notice is that this was Jesus' exact same purpose when he was here on earth. Before Jesus went to the cross, he prays to the Father. And listen to this part of his prayer. He says, I glorified you, the Father, on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. We step into Christ's identity and thus we share in his purpose. You and I are how Christ is revealed today. So what does that look like? 
What does it look like when others see our light, when Christ is revealed through us to those around us? Well, it, it looks like people encountering the embrace of God and seeing and following Jesus. They see that clearly because their path is lit, they see our light, but they also see more clearly because of our light. British author and essayist C.S. Lewis put it best. He wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Toward that end, Jesus gives us two practical words of guidance here. He gives us a caveat and gives us an instruction. And he starts with the caveat. In verse 15, he says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And honestly, this sounds somewhat silly. So picture this with me. You're out camping or the power goes out and it's dark. So you go and you find yourself a light. It could be a lamp, it could be a flashlight, and you go and turn that on. And then you proceed to take a bucket or a basket and put it over it. Who does this? Right? Like this isn't one of those things where like most of you are normal human beings and then there's a handful of y'all that are really weird and you put pineapple on pizza. Right? Like <laughs> nobody turns on the light and then proceeds to cover it up. So if no one does this, then why does Jesus mention it? Because you and I live like this. You are the light of the world, and our light is supposed to shine for all others to see, and then we proceed to go and put a bucket or a bowl over it and cover it up. A bowl is anything that hides or hinders the light from achieving its purpose. Take a look at this again. You notice that, that this bucket did not prevent the light from shining, right? This thing is still on, but it does prevent it from being seen. In the same way, a bowl in your life is anything that prevents you from achieving your purpose, to light the path that others will see and glorify God. This doesn't turn off the light because that's your identity in Christ. And here's the thing, there's nothing and no one in this world that can turn off Jesus. But it does render you useless. So practically, what are the bowls in our life? The obvious answer is sin. And if we're honest, we are far too casual about sin today. For some of us, sin has so deeply enveloped and covered the love and joy of Christ in your life that nobody, including ourselves sometimes, can see it. For others, it might look a little different. Let me give you an example. So part of my work has me speaking and presenting my research at conferences and forums and when I was first getting started, I was still in school, and I had the reputation of being a ferocious debater at these forums. Right? Funny thing about the world, the less you know, the more you think you know. So I was young and stupid, but I thought I knew everything. And if someone asked me a genuine question, I'd give them a genuine response. But if someone challenged me, I was more than happy to shut it down and embarrass them so thoroughly that they would not dare speak up again. And that became my MO. And if I'm honest, I was pretty proud about that. And so one day I'm having a conversation with a friend and a classmate, and I expressed frustration that in this area of research, we were asking these deep, profound questions. And it didn't seem like any of our classmates cared or were interested in asking these questions. And I was expressing this frustration. I'll never forget what he says to me. He says, Sam, they're interested and they're asking those questions. They just don't want to ask you. And I, I didn't ask him what he meant because I didn't have to. See, the thing that I was so proud of, this great achievement in my life, was hiding the love and joy of Christ. And in doing so, it was hindering the truth, the one thing I thought I was pursuing. When people saw me or heard me, they didn't see or hear Jesus. They just saw a jerk. So what is that like in your life? When people encounter you, what do they see at home, at work? In your proudest moment, in that great achievement, who do people see? 
What about when you're waiting in line at Target? See, what I love about Jesus' teaching style is that he never just says, do not, without then telling us what we should do. Right? He always gives us another direction to go in. So in Genesis, he says, do not eat from that tree, but that tree will give you eternal life. In right? Matthew, he says, do not worry about tomorrow, but seek the kingdom of God. And he does the same thing here. In verse 15, he warns us against the bowl that covers the light. But then he gives us a different direction. And he says, instead, they put it, the light, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. If a bowl is anything that hides or hinders the light, then a stand is anything that elevates or showcases the light. So if you look over here, you know this, that this table, this stand, does not shine. Right? The, the stand doesn't do any shining, but instead it raises the light to a more prominent place so that its light reaches further and more people can see it. In the same way, a stand in your life is not something that's perfect, but it is anything that elevates the light, that allows people to see God in you, and more specifically, to see God at work in your life. So practically speaking, what are the stands in our life? What elevates, what makes known the love of Christ? See, we have this misconception that, that there are certain things in our life that, that are stands, in the sense that they have to be neatly wrapped and packaged with a bow on top. And we look to things like a law and successful marriage or raising good kids or employment or ministry. But, and those are all good things, right? They're all good things that can, that can proclaim the love of God. But here's the thing. A lot of you come here week after week, and, and that's not your story. You have a broken marriage or out of control kids or you can't find work. And you, you look at that, those things in your life and, and, and if you look at them, you say, there's no way, there's no way that any of these pieces can point people to Jesus. But here's what's awesome. That God can use Anything, anything to shine his love, if, there's an if, if you'll let him. In fact, if you follow Jesus' ministry through the Gospels, one of the things that you're going to find is that oftentimes the broken pieces make the most effective stands. They do the most to elevate and showcase the light. I lost my father when I was in grad school. I just turned 23. And he passed after a short battle with pancreatic cancer. Now, I had a very complicated relationship with my dad. And so that further complicated the grieving process. And during this time, I had two friends, two remarkable individuals who journeyed with me. And the one, she had just lost her child. She miscarried after a long time of praying and trying to become pregnant. And the other friend, he just lost his spouse. She left him for someone else and then asked that he stop attending their church where he previously was on staff because she wanted to go and didn't want to see him there. And, and the thing about these two friends is that they have been faithfully and consistently stepping into their identity as the light of the world. And so when these earth-shattering, life-changing, traumatic events occurred, it didn't lessen the blow any. But it did turn those events in their life into stands by which their light shone. Their raw brokenness became their stand. And I and, and all those in their orbit, we didn't just see, but we experienced the love of God because of them in the midst of those situations. And my path in those days, in those weeks, in those months was lit by their light. We have this inclination to believe that anything we perceive as negative in our life has to be a bull, right? So a failed marriage or out of control kids or unemployment. And we tend to hide those things away because we're ashamed and we feel embarrassment. And then we tend to think that there's some things that are definitely stands like a successful marriage or a good home life or the white picket fence. Yet God can use any of those things to showcase his love. 
Or we can be selfish and use any of those things to direct attention to ourselves. Sometimes the things that we are most proud of are actually the things that are most successful in hiding the light. And sometimes the things that we are most ashamed of or most embarrassed by, that we look at and we say, there's absolutely no way that this can help people see Jesus. Sometimes those are the things that are precisely what God uses. The Bible tells a story about when Jesus went out of his way to meet a Samaritan woman at the well. And this is significant because she is living in shame and embarrassment of her past. For one, she's a Samaritan. And in this time, that is a despised ethnicity. But also, she's had five husbands. And the guy she's with right now ain't her husband. But then she meets Jesus. And watch what happens. John chapter 4, starting in verse 26, Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he, the Messiah. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Notice here that her past does not change. What changed? Her identity. Whereas her past, which was once the greatest source of shame and embarrassment in her life, that could have been the bowl that covers the light of Christ, and this transformation becomes the stand from which her light shines and from which the gospel goes forward. Some of you are very talented in certain areas. You have leadership skills, you have advanced education, you have respect and recognition at work or in the community, and each of those things can be the tools that help to elevate the light. But they can just as easily be the tools that help to bury it. Meanwhile, your inability to find work, or your firing, or your lack of a certain skill set, or your lack of a certain kind of education, we tend to think these things are bulls, but... If we believe that God does not make mistakes, then each of those things can be the platform upon which the story of God is told. Not in spite of your challenges, but in the midst of your challenges. This one's near and dear to me because of my work. How you vote and how you do politics. This is a place where when we do it, we tend to think, oh, it's definitely a stand. And when they do it, it's definitely a bull. But the reality is that whether your politics hides or showcases the light has very little, if anything, to do with who you, which candidate you support or which party wins. Rather, whether your politics hides or elevates the light as important as the candidates are, is determined by when people see you engaging in politics, who do they see? Do they see your candidate or do they see Jesus? This is a question I ask myself regularly. When people watch me engage in politics, when they watch me at work, what do they see? Where does my light lead them? To a candidate? To a policy agenda? Or to Jesus. You see, whether something is a bull or stand is determined by one thing only, its effect on the light. Right? Look over here again. This bucket can be very, very useful. Right? If you're out camping, having a bucket can come in handy. You can carry water, it can carry wood. These things can be handy around the house. But the same thing can serve to hide the light. And the same thing can also serve to elevate the light and be a stand. The same things in your life can hide the light and can elevate the light and vice versa. So whether something is a stand or a bull, the only question is what's its effect on the light? So the relationships in your life, your family, your work, your behaviors, your attitudes, how you treat people. Does it showcase the love of Christ or does it hide it? 
Can I push on some of you a little bit more? Some of you have been faithfully walking and stepping into this identity as the light of the world. And you have been diligent in shepherding everything in your life so that there are stands that help elevate the light. And I just want to challenge you to take this one step further. You know this in verse 16. Jesus says, let your light shine before others. Where is that light most effective? Up front, going before others. Let's revisit that camping example. Right? If you're out camping and it's dark, if you're out for a hike and it's dark, where do you want the light? With your guide up front or with the guy that's straggling behind everyone else? Light is most effective when it's up front leading. You are the light of the world. You are Christ revealed to this world and your purpose is to light the path that others will see and glorify God. And that is done most effectively when we are leading from the front with our light going before others. Church, we are not called to follow this world. We are not called to chase after what the world does and just copy it and Christianize it. You are the light of the world. The world needs you leading from the front, not just in word, but in deed, in how you live. For some of you, you sat on the sidelines in 2021. In 2022, it's time to lead. From the front, with your light, going before others. So how do you know if something in your life is hiding the light or showcasing it. When you look at any part of your life, whether you think it's good, bad, or downright ugly, you ask yourself one question. Why does this thing matter? Why does this relationship matter? Why does my family matter? Why does this job matter? Why does how I treat my server at lunch today matter? And if your answer is anything besides because this represents Jesus, then that thing is a bull and it covers the light of Christ. And at what cost? That when others meet you, they don't meet or encounter Jesus. This is hard, and if we're honest, this can be deeply painful because it requires a genuine humility. In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Several years ago, I asked myself, if I were to die today, who would speak at my funeral and what would they say? And I actually began to write out funeral speeches. Right? Like, what would my family say? What would my colleagues say or my students that I teach or my best friend? What would Pastor Joe or Pastor Brad say at my funeral? And as I began to draft and revise these speeches, certain themes started to rise. And I took those themes and I, I compared them to my life goals. And my life goals were things like, I wanted to become the most successful political strategist of this generation. I wanted to walk into any room and become the smartest person in that room. I wanted to marry the right girl. I wanted to publish some groundbreaking idea that would revolutionize how our society thinks. And none of those things are bad. But how many of those hypothetical achievements do you think made it into my funeral speeches? Not one. Rather, I want people to remember me by saying Sam was generous or Sam was genuine. And so I started asking myself that question, why? What's at stake with generosity? And what I realized is that generosity means that I own my things, or sorry, God owns my things and my things don't own me. Right? What about being genuine? Right? Why is that so important? Because ge being genuine means that what you see is what you get. And that means when you see me, you get to see God at work in my good moments, but also in my bad moments. And when I realized was that when I'm gone, I don't care how many campaigns I've won. I don't care how many policy pieces I've changed or anything else I've attached my name to. And this was deeply painful, but, but it was also deeply satisfying because it freed me to step into my identity and to embrace my purpose as the light of the world. So why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? Let me tell you about the impact 
that letting your light shine can have. I grew up poor. I'm a pastor's kid, grew up child of immigrants, grew up paycheck to paycheck. One Christmas Eve, the sink in our laundry room broke. And so we're all in the laundry room, we're trying to fix this, and the doorbell rings. And it's my Sunday school teacher. And he was coming from Christmas Eve service, and uh, it was brought poinsettia over for our family. And he was a well-known contractor, built tons of houses. And, and so we, he heard that our sink was broken and said, hey, can I take a look? So we invite him in, and there on Christmas Eve is my Sunday school teacher, a church leader, respected in the community, in a suit, lying on my dirty, dusty laundry room floor, fixing our sink. And when he finished, we invite him to stay for coffee or tea as a thank you. And he says, no, I, I can't. My wife's waiting in the car. <laughs> so we walk out, and sure enough, there she is waiting in the car. Here's the thing. I remember some of the things that they taught me in Sunday school that year. But I'll tell you what I've never forgotten. I have never forgotten that image of this church leader, of this contractor, in the suit, lying on my dirty dusty laundry room floor, fixing my sink while his wife waited in the car on Christmas Eve. And that was over 20 years ago. That is the impact that letting your light shine can have. So why would you ever hide it? Let it shine, church. See, if Christ is revealed today in his church through you and through me, then when people meet us, they should meet Jesus, right? When people meet you, this is what they should see, But do they, or do they see this? What do people see when they meet you? When your spouse meets you, does he or she see Jesus? What about your kids, or your boss, or your employees, or your teachers? your cashier at Aldi, or your server at lunch today? What about the person that just cut you off on the highway or the person you just cut off on the highway? What about the person on the other side of that computer screen who's reading your Facebook posts? Who do they see? So how do we do this? Here's how I started. About a decade ago, I started praying these two prayers at the start of every day. Two simple prayers, and it's guided me in my journey since. Number one, God, would you help me know you more today? So when I go to bed that night, I want to know God more, not just more about him. I want to know God more than when I woke up. In 1 John 4, John writes, whoever does not love does not know God. So God, would you help me to know you more today? And number two, God, would you give me one opportunity to be Jesus to someone? Just one, just one opportunity. And here's what you're going to start seeing when, if, if, when you pray this. Countless opportunities are going to arise throughout your day. Why? Because we see so much more clearly when we lead from the front, allowing our light to go before others. Here's the thing, I I don't know what last year was like for you. If I can be honest with you, it was a really challenging year for me. And I don't know what this next year holds. I can't promise you it's gonna be better. But what I can tell you is that you and I were chosen by God to be the revelation of Christ to this world and in this moment. And anything and everything that 2022 brings can serve to proclaim that light if we let it. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you. We're humbled that you have chosen us to be the light, to be your revelation in this world. And God, we just ask that that wherever this last year has taken us, we, we walk into this new year embracing this identity. And Spirit, would you lead us to shepherd the things in our life, good, bad, ugly? Would you lead us to shepherd those things that they would be stands, that would proclaim your love, even the moments that we don't understand, 
that when others see us, they would see you. God, we love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.